Our discussion has so far inventoried a number of different kinds of digital objects um, considered as targets of modeling practice, um, including simple objects, which we model through surrogates, or informational relations that we can model through links in RDF, uh, and also complex objects that are in effect a surrogate plus a metadata or a surrogate plus commentary or a surrogate plus some other incrustation of stuff. Um, I want to focus here on another kind of modeling, um, which I'm going to call representations of intellectual systems. Uh, thinking back to Alan Rainier's talk yesterday, I think what I mean by intellectual may be extending what he means by intentional. Uh, in other words, systems in which the system itself may be an object of scrutiny while in use, or in which, as Carrie Krauss put it, the noise we make, and I'm paraphrasing here, the noise we make while trying to communicate signal is itself of interest to us. And the TEI is an interesting example of such a system, and it's particularly interesting to me because it offers, I think, a formal way of modeling types of information that are pervasively present in scholarship and may be given a great deal of careful attention that results in detailed formal description, but have not typically been formalized as data in scholarly practice. So in other, in, in other words, they've been formalized for use by humans, but not as computational processes. And what I'd like to do in this presentation is to take a closer look at the TEI as an intellectual modeling system and consider how it represents these kinds of complex vectors of information, and also how this information might be used more effectively in digital scholarship. So let's step back and think, what are we modeling when we encode a TEI document? Um, and this is just sort of entering it into evidence, because I think most of us are already familiar with this system. So first of all, through our use of markup on its own, without regard for a schema, just sticking codes in the text or you know, in the, the, uh, the data that we're considering, uh, we may be modeling a document or a data source. Um, for example, selecting pieces of it for representation, describing those pieces using a formal language that is internally consistent and that allows us to associate a semantics with the markers that we use. So this is the inner circle here in the slides of the document itself. That's one thing we might be modeling when we encode a TEI document. And in the case of the TEI, the information that we're modeling here in the XML data may also include not only the document or the data source itself, but also a self-conscious or more or less self-conscious representation of our transcriptional, our editorial, our interpretative activities with respect to that document undertaken as part of the creation of the digital object. And it may also include relational information that connects this document to others or to other data sources. So that's all still in the, the document itself. Um, no, I'm sorry, that's the associated information. Um, by using a markup system that has reference to a schema, so by using the TEI, by using a specific markup language, we're also modeling the type or genre of documents. And we have to acknowledge that both of those terms obviously deserve some scrutiny on their own um, that it, you know, there isn't time for me to give here. Um, but in other words, we're locating this document or this set of information within a system that identifies some documents as being the kind of documents we are modeling here um, and by implication that there are others that fall outside of that category. So another way to put this is to say that we are modeling this document as an instance of a genre, whether or not in some larger sense it really is a member of that genre. In other words, we're sort of assimilating it or appropriating it to that genre and claiming ownership of it in that respect. So broadly speaking, we might term this domain as the, the document ecology, the set of characteristics that constitute the commonalities among this set of documents or this set of statements. And in this way, we're also modeling our own intentions with respect to that document, both on its own and as a member of the collection, whether implied or actual. So by making a claim that this document belongs in this class of documents, we also say that we will treat it as such. We will process it as such, we will read it as such, we will interpret it as such. And these statements also affect the information that will be made visible or accessible to other consumers of the data. 
the kinds of expressiveness, in other words, that the document can retain within the communicative system that we're setting up for it. And as we generate successive versions of such models, of such genres or such appropriations, we're also making claims with respect to that document projected through time. And at the same time, finally, these statements, these kinds of statements, always implicitly and sometimes explicitly have meaning in relation to other project statements about and treatment of their own documents. So the use of the TEI itself expresses an intention that the encoding of the document be intelligible within a larger system of meaning defined by the TEI. And the specifics of that use, so what elements are used, what elements are not used, what attributes, values are used, and so forth, also situates the encoding that we're doing within a spectrum of use, a very broad spectrum. Um, so, you know, is this, is our encoding, comparatively speaking, a very detailed encoding or a very impoverished encoding? Does it have specific disciplinary affiliations? And we might call this sphere of information, this last um, outer rank, the social ecology of our documents. Um, and in this, in uh, the TEI, this social ecology is expressed and accomplished through the odd, the, uh, the one document does it all system. The ways in which markup models documents and information about documents is of course familiar and in the interest of time I'm gonna sort of set it aside, bracket it off, and I'd like to take a closer look at the schema and the odd. So first of all, thinking about schemas, um, as Wendell Pease and Alan Liu have shown in detail, historically schemas as constraint systems have typically arisen in process as a result of the need to regulate the manufacture of pieces of a work process independently and formally, rather than by seeing whether the work process itself results in a functional outcome. So for example, instead of waiting to assemble the lawnmower um, to find out whether it'll work, we test each individual piece against a gauge, and then we can discover you know, the flaws and inefficiencies in the work process. So schemas help us regulate process. And hence, schemas also model a diachronic information space. So any given schema models a stage in a process, even if that process has only one stage. And the entire process can be modeled as a series of schemas. And it follows from this that the schema, considered from this perspective, also models the expertise or intention being exercised at that stage in the process. So for example, in a workflow for a journal article that begins with certain kind of light authorial encoding followed by a layer of editorial encoding, the latter process, the, the editorial encoding process, might involve a different schema with elements for consistent keywording of topics, for example, or process metadata. And the schema that regulates the final publication might need to enforce the presence of certain kinds of required publication metadata or renditional um, information. So having made this suggestion, I think it's interesting to note that the TEI, in the TEI, for historical reasons, schemas appear in an odd sort of way to possess a kind of timelessness and agentlessness. Um, I should say, you know, appear to the uninitiated perhaps, or appear at a naive look, um, to possess a kind of timelessness or agentlessness because the TEI is framed discursively, it's, it's inter, it's inter posed into our sort of digital scholarly universe as if it represented a set of convictions about documents, you know, philosophical convictions, rather than as a set of functional or processing requirements. And for many individual scholarly users of the TEI, as distinct from, you know, large-scale projects focused on production, schemas aren't in fact conceptualized as part of a work system. Um, perhaps because the academic setting of that use tends to sort of obfuscate or, or set aside that dimension of the work in favor of a more timeless view which t in which the model of the document represents above all a set of intellectual convictions or methodological <clears throat> convictions. Time in the TEI is perceived in a way as, as changes in those convictions, right? Developments in our research trajectory, refining our ideas about documents, embracing more and more of the intellectual territory 
um, of text encoding uh, at both the individual level, right? I, as the encoder, am improving my understanding of my texts, and also at the level of the TEI itself, which offers a kind of steady narrative of improvement. The idea that we're, you know, refining, we're developing new features, um, and so forth. There's a kind of even a, a nice technological progressivism there going from P3 to P4 to P5 to P6, we assume. So that's sort of a, a quick view of, the, of the, the ecology of the schema, let's say. And let's now turn to the odd system and the odd customization file, um, which are you know, you know, a very distinctive and in some ways, I think, entirely unique way of defining a markup language. So any given odd customization file taken on its own models a single set of choices about document constraint aimed at expressing a set of decisions about the modeling of individual documents or a set of documents, and aims at creating convergence in the modeling of a single set of documents. So a single set of constraints that has a particular, um, a, a particular modeling aim. Any given customization file also models the delta, the difference, the vector of difference between our local situation and the you know, the TEI central, and multiple odd files taken together model divergences between multiple data sets. So as we increase the number of customizations we're looking at, we're also getting an increasingly complex view of the kinds of divergences that these customizations represent, and we can also look at um, you know, the, the nature of these divergences. So these might be data sets from different projects, or they might be multiple stages in the development of a single data set, or stages in a workflow, or stages in the development of a project's thinking um, about how to model the data. And by comparing whichever the nature of the, uh, of the sequence of customizations, by comparing them, we can also get an understanding of how these customizations differ from one another, as well as how they differ from the TEI in its unmodified state. So, in a way, the odd also reinvigorates our ability to understand the schema not as a set of timeless convictions that, um, you know, that express my, my true beliefs about the text, but rather as a set of functional or contingent, let's say, constraints that operate within a specific ecology, within a workflow, within a developmental narrative, or within a, um, you know, a disciplinary community in which debate is taking place. In the modeling of divergences here, we can also see another important but underexplored relationship being modeled, namely that of debate and dissent. So for example, debate within the TEI community about what features are fundamental to our understanding of text. For example, the, the diversity of aims and methods that produces the complexity of the TEI as a whole in the first place. Um, also, we can model changes in the terms of that debate over time, which register as changes to the TEI schema overall. And we can also model dissent on the part of any individual, any specific individual or project from any specific, from any specific modeling decision the TEI has agreed upon. So if there's some particular area of the TEI uh, schema as a whole which is particularly controversial, we can identify points of dissent from that particular um, component. For example, on whether a specific element should have a particular content model or should be permitted to go in a specific place. And this debate and dissent is modeled with considerable explicitness in the, in the odd customization, since the customization file records what elements and attributes are included and excluded and what changes to classes have been made and what kinds of controlled vocabularies are there, what new and renamed elements have been created and so forth. So we have here a scene of considerable texture and complexity considered either as a cross-sectional snapshot or as a temporal sequence. As a cross-section, what, what, what we're being given here to work with, what we can imagine through this, through this modeling exercise is 
for example, debate at any particular moment in, in a history. Um, we can model uncertainty, we can model places where we are hypothesizing or speculating in a contingent way. We can model alternatives and choices. We can model intentions. If we consider it as a sequence, in other words, if we introduce time, we can model work process. We can model developmental processes. We can model the history of debates and the history of actions. And in a sense, I think what we're seeing here is the emergence of a set of tools for modeling something like historiography or whatever the equivalent might be in literary studies or in any other discipline. In other words, a self-conscious representation of how theory and practice change over time. And you know, this is at its per the uncharitable way of characterizing this would be the, the, the extreme refinement of navel gazing. And you know, looking back in retrospect over the conversations we've had earlier today, I think one of the questions I'm raising is um, got to be the value of this kind of historiography. In other words, is there crudely put a market for it? Is there an intellectual market for it? Um, or is it really a matter for us of just getting back to the data? Um, so I'll be interested to hear uh, what Wendell um, thinks about that. Um, but I think that the, the emergence of the ability to do historiography through models um, is at the very least of historical interest in the development of the field. So what can we learn from the TEI's example here? Um, the TEI's potential to serve as such a tool set, as, as a, a set for, among other things, modeling, modeling the, the history of our own ideas, um, it has arisen, first of all, by virtue of its situation at the center of a very complex modeling problem, namely humanities textual data. And secondly, it has arisen because by its nature, the TEI is designed to handle not only the modeling of that data, but also the markers of transcriptional and editorial and interpretive self-awareness. So the TEI is designed to handle the non-transparency of the modeling process itself. That's part of what's being modeled. And again, I, would, I think I would try to align that with Alan's sense of, the, of intention as being a distinctive part of humanities data modeling. I think that this kind of self-awareness is cognate with that, that intentionality in the sense that you meant that word. And thirdly, the TEI's potential in this way has arisen through its responding to scholarly pressure, so pressure from scholarly users, to provide ever more nuanced ways to capture these contours of scholarly responsibility. And I think in a way this is reflecting um, Paul's sense that you can't do just a little data modeling and Alan's sort of, you know, the, the push to take other people's models seriously. I think that in, in the same sense, a kind of intellectual curiosity has driven um, the TEI community to crave more and more nuanced ways of accounting for the non-transparency of our modeling methods, or sorry, of performing those modeling methods in a, in a more and more responsible and transparent way. And to think about how the digital medium itself can serve as a vector for scholarly ideas and scholarly work. And I think the proposed new genetic module um, for um, manuscripts in the TEI is a good example of this. So I'd like to just close with two questions that I think uh, I still need to have answered um, that may be things we can discuss as a group. Um, first of all, is there an advantage to modeling such an intricately connected field of information within a single representational system or are there parts of this information that would be better factored out and handled separately? And I mean, understanding that already there has been some of that factoring just in the system of the, the odd and the schema, um, the way that ecology works in the TEI. Is the TEI basically like a gigantic lint ball here or is, there, is it a naturally coherent system of information? And then ultimately, I'd also like to consider whether this kind of complex, layered, intellectual modeling might also suggest methods that we could use in other digital humanities contexts or whether it really has as its domain the special problems of, of text markup as, as we now do it. So thank you very much.
in some ways, the odd system is, as far as I know, uh, unique or at least unusual, but it's, um, it's not unprecedented. It does have historical parallels in system maintenance practice. Um, a great deal of it is based silently on lessons I learned from the system administrator at the first place I worked. And uh, large parts of it are modeled very explicitly, at least explicitly as an head in mind um, on the methods used by Donald Knuth to separate local changes to tech and its related systems from changes he made. So the idea of defining a complex system by defining a set of changes on a base system which you do not touch is, as beautiful as it is, not one for which the TDI dare take credit. Um, but I guess we get credit for having the, 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 the good taste to <laughs> follow Knuth's example. And no, I certainly didn't want to give the TEI credit for that idea, but just to treat it as a kind of interesting case study, maybe. But, but having at that case study a little bit, um, you're, ex you, you see, you're expressing the idea that we can talk about our different, you know, Paul and I can talk about our, our different modeling of similar or the same text by talking about our odd files. The, uh, am I channeling that? Well, talk, talking about suggests a purely human and, and probably inefficient process, sort of like talking about your subst elements instead of just saying, here's where Shelley deleted something. But I would say processing our odd files jointly. In other words, having some me mechanism of doing some interesting computational comparison. And I'm wondering if there's any advantage to thinking about that computation and that comparison on the odd file as opposed to thinking about that comparison on the schema that one generates from the odd file. <coughs> um, thinking at first blush that all that stuff in the big white circle that's the TDI that you know, neither one of us has changed will fall out because it's the same. Uh, and, and maybe we just do better. At, what is it the TI has gained us here by creating the indirection lot? Well, <laughs> Let's work. Well, I would say. Well, but we were talking about machine classes that can get them. <laughs> I'm imagining that um, there's a greater level of access to the human intellect side of things. So I'm going to try to come up with a good example here, but imagine that from version to version, the TEI changes the behavior of a certain element so that I um, am no longer served by it. And my new schema and my new odd customization will take that change into account by reversing it so that my new schema is identical to my old schema, and yet the odd is very different because the odd now expresses disagreement with the decision that the TEI made between those two versions. So I think, I think, I mean, that may be an impoverished example, but it gives a sense of what the odd is giving us access to that the schema doesn't necessarily give us access to. Uh, yeah, I, I think to that specific question, I have more general responses also, but to that specific question, I, I, I think the, the answer to Sid is pretty much along the lines of that odd was designed with the intention, with the premise that it was going to be more useful directly to the users than the schema that would be generated out of it. In other words, that that, that layering is there. And you know this very well, right? I mean, the, the, um, you know, that layering is a, the, offers facility to the system as a whole for, you know, for documentation and maintenance. And, and you know, that's just the design premise of the odd. And we can question whether it succeeds in that and have a reasonable discussion about the, the, you know, whether ADA actually addresses these requirements, but that's a separate conversation. But the, so, so I, I, wasn't, so I wasn't doubting the utility of ADA in itself for system maintenance or for different from TI, but I was wondering about when we want to compare the differences in our systems, is it better to compare our ADA files or better just to compare our schemes? Well, is that, I mean, um, uh, is that a sort of a, a practical question about um, what, what sorts of information we would get from doing one versus the other? Or uh, are, are those exercises not completely isomorphic? Or 
the extent that they're not. They're, they're not. Yeah, I know they're not. And, 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 I, and I would suggest that, in fact, to the extent that the odd documents as well as parameterizes its choices, the odd is going to be the place you go, right? Isn't it? Well, um, I'm not sure. I, I, I mean, if I'm comparing them and I'm comparing the odd, the odd I'm also to compare the pros that we wrote. And that's... You think that's bad? Well, trying to do that by machine may not be such a clever thing. Oh, did we assume that the machine was going to be unaided? Please. machine help here, yeah. I was imagining that, that for the kind of research that we want to do on people's customizations, certainly I would want, I mean, I'm imagining the beautiful visualizations and things like that that can show, you know, sectors of the TI. Right, at the same, but at the, the same time, you're going to be able to click, and there will be the pros. Sure, and in fact, one could imagine like going beyond one better and providing control vocabularies for documenting the decisions. So, you know, did you open the cell and hate it? Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, Exactly, rationale. Right, exactly. I mean, the pros of companies' the rationale would be nice if the rationale. Yeah, and, and whether, you know, designing and building that system, how you would operationalize that as a set of queries that were just the odds or a set of queries that were both together is a, is a development question, right? I, I think that's true. I, I, think, I think it's pragmatic almost as much as intellectual. You had a more general question. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, because Julie really did ask us to also think about this not just in the TI context. You know, I think that's really important to do because you know, I, you know, I, I think that there's, um, it's not simply that, um, I mean, this is not just about the, the, the TI context. The, the, in many ways, due to the complexity of the, the TI and the, and the nature of the goals that the TI sets to address, it's led over time to the formalization of these processes, and yet that doesn't mean that these processes are especially unique to TI at all. Right. Right? Um, and with respect to that, um, I would go back to the, to the two workflows that I showed yesterday, which are directly in, you know, an outgrowth of that same understanding of the role of the schema and then the historical markup-based systems versus its applications of the humanities, because of course, you know, when I point to one more complex workflow and I say that this is what we want to be able to do, I don't really mean to be saying that that's not all what we're already doing, because I think that it's actually really important to understand that all along we have not simply looked at the schema as being some sort of, you know, some sort of receivable that we simply plug into our system, but rather that the schema itself is a site of development and, uh, um, and, uh, and, and scrutiny. And so um, what, what's really, in, 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 in that context, the most important thing to keep in mind about the difference between these two workflows, the second more complex workflow has internal groups in it, which, in, which, which uh, you know, go along with this idea of the process as being the product, that, that, that you don't, you, you can no longer distinguish so much between the, pro the product of the process as being the, 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 the single moment in that system, that, that there's actually something else more complicated going on. And in particular, in, in, in terms of the way in which systems, uh, systems management and maintenance works, that internal looping is what allows the more complex system to be responsive to pressures from an outside environment. Right, so that we, so that when we discover we want to do something new, the system is already built to support that sort of destabilization. Rather than having to go in and re-engineer everything, the system is already built to support sort of, you know, it's like we're maintaining the, you know, the, the airplane on the runway. We're not having to go back to the design shop and start with blueprints from the start. Um, and um, and I think that that kind of schematic view of it can be generalized because all humanities-oriented projects that I've seen necessarily have to take that sort of self-conscious view because we are discovering what we're doing while doing it. And, because, and, and also because we consider that the, that, the, uh, um, that the goal of our process is in the discovery of the process, which is what distinguishes us from running a publishing system that publishes a, you know, X number of um, issues of a journal every year and um, puts out by thousand copies of it. Um, and you know, expects to maintain itself largely without change over time. I mean, it's not obviously a complete dichotomy, but there's a big difference in, 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 in 
goals there. And so, of course, all humanities projects have to have that kind of introspective, self-critical quality, and we document what we do, and we publish about it, and we go to conferences, and give papers, and ask people to criticize our methods, and give us some ideas, and that's just part of what we do. And I don't really see anything fundamentally different about the, the way in which the TDI projects are doing it. It's just that the TDI projects have much more infrastructure to support it. Right, I mean, I think that was what struck me about it, was that why in the TDI do we have this comparatively highly formalized system for documenting something which in, in the scholarly world generally, and in you know, digital humanities projects generally, is of great interest and is, is documented in all sorts of ways, but they're just not formalized. In other words, is, has the TDI evolved this formal system purely for practical purposes, and I'm just going to a system that does these lovely things, or is it something that is lacking in other places that really ought to be formalizing? Um, yeah, well, I think at least part of the answer to that is that the TDI people want it formalized. They like formalizing. <laughs> Maybe that's the answer. They just like formalizing. <laughs> So forth, and I'll say a bit more about how this 
works. What you see here is basically our main screen in which um, users do the tagging and on the right you see a markup tree, uh, a tag set tree. Uh, tag sets can be imported, exported. Um, as I said, they can be expanded on as you work with the document. Um, you can enable or disable elements by ticking off boxes, so it's highly customizable. Um, where does it come from? Well, it started out as a project to basically re-implement and re-engineer TACT. Um, and those of you who have been treated to TACT know why we love it and why we hate it. Um, and um, TACT, of course, um, has been extremely useful and I think uh, it is still one of the programs that I love most. Unfortunately, I cannot learn it any longer on this machine because I have got the right emulator, uh, but my students don't love it, um, rightly so, I think. Um, this gives you an idea of the project context. Um, so uh, we started by, out by uh, looking at TACT again, then we did the re-implementation of CATMA. That's what you have just seen and uh, what uh, uh, the current work is based on. We're currently busy with a third step called CLIA, and that's a collaborative literature exploration and annotation environment. Um, and if you should ask why there is an axon on the E in exploration, uh, for no other reason than to confuse uh, the recipients of our grant proposal, which was Google, um, and we wanted to demonstrate to them that there are indeed characters um, that are a bit more difficult than straightforward asking. Um, but they appreciated that um, and gave us money to do this. CLIA is going to be uh, fully browser based, Java based, um, and it can run uh, in a client server environment but also as a web applet on your uh, machine. And it is backed up by a repository um, function, which uh, we're currently developing. It is supposed to interface directly with Google Books so that you can import um, anything from Google Books, provided they actually give us uh, access to their material. Um, to be honest, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, the, uh, I guess background of current legal developments there extremely careful about making promises there. Be this as it may, that's not really essential. It could be any repository, it could be uh, whatever that one wanted to um, use. More important perhaps is um, a prototype type for a machine learning module, which we are also developing, um, because uh, we want to actually exploit uh, the markup which users generate um, and we have the hope that over time, using machine learning algorithms, we will be able to identify some of the lower level tasks, uh, repetitive tasks, and create something which we call a heuristic machine that will make suggestions. So the system will give you, or will possibly produce um, feedback in the form of, hey, I've discovered something, you might want to tag this as X, Y, Z, but you better check whether I'm right or not. We, we don't uh, have the, the dream of uh, automating um, high-level markup by any means. Um, I don't think that's ever going to happen. The next step, um, as of next year, will be uh, Poirin Clear. Um, we've just attracted funding for that. That will add on visualization functionality and a more robust uh, machine learning driven heuristic pre-processing engine um, and uh, that's, let's see how far we get with that. Let's take a step back from, from this uh, project history and look at more uh, conceptual issues. Uh, when we started out with developing Katma against the background of TACT, we tried to understand why are we actually doing this? Uh, that's the what and why of the markup. And following on you know, the various contributions that have been made in the field um, to, in order to distinguish types of markup, 
Um, this is a variant on it, and I think that in terms of how Catman and Clear are developed, we, we are somewhere oscillating between performative function of markup and discursive function of markup. On the performative side, I would see the, what we know as procedural markup, which instructs the machine or the human being um, as to how to process the text on a very basic level. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have discursive markup, which enables human readers to interpret the text. And there, of course, we're way into the field of semantics. And somewhere in between, we have declarative markup, which um, is sitting on the fence. Um, and that is really what uh, we also encounter in our normal practice as literary scholars. Uh, so we're oscillating between these um, two poles. If you approach Margaret from the point of view of somebody who's interested mainly in hermeneutics, as I happen to be, you have to be clear about the must-haves of discursive Margaret. Um, these are, I believe, the following. One, um, it must facilitate collaborative and non-deterministic annotation. And that means it must allow for multiple overlap, uh, for multiple marker, for overlap, and for concurrent tagging. And two, you must conceptualize a markup as dynamic and recursive. Um, so it must allow for extensibility, for multiple and even contradictory markup, and for seamless integration of markup and analysis back and forth. Um, which brings us to an attempt to develop a taxonomy of markup types and data models underlying what we were doing. Uh, and my start here is a remark by Ellen, among um, others, who wrote this wonderful sentence, there's no such thing as no markup. Um, so it's not as if we start with something that doesn't have markup. We have something, um, a type of markup that is implicit in the text, and I would just call it opaque, uh, an opaque data model. It is there, but nobody's actually realized that it is there. Then we have inline and deterministic markup, which is normally linear. And here you see my very uh, uh, quick attempt to uh, mark, the begin mark at the beginning of the sentence. Uh, it's the first word in the sentence. Now we all know uh, how do we distinguish a first word if there's not a clear cut sentence before it, or a full stop, or, or anything uh, in the English language, wonderful capitalization, but of course that doesn't work proper names. Um, so you need word classes, and here's another attempt. So you have nested inline deterministic markup, where you have word class, um, the adverb in this case, and you then have the sentence start. And linear becomes sequential and slightly more complicated. The next step would be to really venture into standoff and descriptive markup, which takes more relational shape where you have uh, three features that all point to the same string, the first five characters of this sentence, the word <coughs> there. And then comes the big leap to discursive markup, where suddenly you have things such as overlap. And if you look at the standard uh, notation at the beginning of these brackets, uh, it goes from 1 to 5, 1 to 5, 1 to 8, and 1 to 38. So, different markups applied to various um, string sections, but uh, the first five characters are within um, all of them. Um, and this really becomes discursive because it is sort of modeling a discourse on what we have just read in this sentence. Uh, it, we have different focus underlying each and every of these annotations. How do we implement all of this in Catamar? Well, we use a text range based model where a tag references a text range with the offsets, and we use an external standard markup approach where markup is stored um, in that way in order to allow overlap um, and um, to facilitate um, tagging by multiple users and where markup in itself can then be aggregated, exchanged, reapplied, exploited. So I could call it the text which you have marked up um, 
but I'm not, uh, I don't necessarily have to use all of your markup, but I'm going to just take a subset of your tags and what have you. Um, our main device conceptually would be our feature structures, which are TI based in a way, um, but um, of course, to really re import this into a stringently defined TI environment uh, is something that we haven't tackled yet, but I guess in principle it should be um, something that we just left um, out for the time being. Here again is an example for overlapping markup in practice. You see I've marked up Grendel's name here, and his first name is surname, and the um, um, affiliation. Uh, on the right hand side, um, you see the uh, keynote speaker affiliation tag, that's the one that has um, um, the longest extension here. Um, but there are two other ones, an author name tag and a keynote speaker tag. Um, this is what it actually looks like in the XML file. And as you can see here, the tag itself has an ID. And if you then look at uh, the markup that has been generated, there the ID pops up. But there are two other ones, and they refer to the same text range. Um, and don't ask me to translate it. Sense, all I know is that it does point back to these tags I checked it yesterday. <laughs> this is the architecture that we need to make something like this happen collaboratively. And that looks very um, ambitious, but we're almost there in doing this. But the more interesting question here is how can we model what we do when we do this? Um, sort of thing collaboratively. And here we have four people involved in uh, marking up the same um, text. And let us just assume that these four colleagues of ours here work in collaboration, probably at the same time on the same document. Um, so this is going to be a, a very interesting process. And the model behind this is what I would Supposed to call an end metadata set to one object data instance model, where you have a text at the bottom that is the object data. I'm deviating here from how data has been used and metadata or turning metadata in this context because I believe that the source object is the data um, and object data. Um, and we have on the left hand side of that bracket multiple. Uh, tagging documents generated and stored in standard fashion. Um, and the bracket on the right symbolizes that within a markup there can be contradiction and ambivalence. Um, so it's not necessarily well structured, um, completely defined, and so forth. Um, the metadata on the object data that we generate can serve various functions. They you see again the procedural to hermeneutic um, development, and we have these tag sets in between. And the question now is, is that really what happens? Does that model suffice to describe collaborative markup? I don't think so. Um, because the interesting thing in our hermeneutic uh, activity is that it actually recursive. It's recursive. It runs on itself. So we need something that takes account, we need a model that takes account of the fact that we mark up the text and then we mark up the markup with the text and we analyze the markup and so forth. The model for this, I think, is um, one that we should look at in a moment, but let me, let me give an example for where this actually occurs, where this activity occurs, because I believe it occurs much earlier than we tend to believe. Here we have the CATMA query builder, which allows you to define a query that operates on a text or on the markup that you have generated on the text. So I start out by defining an object data query. I want to find a word that ends with E Z. Then in the second step, I refine this query by adding um, 
another constraint, and this constraint now is one that actually calls out a tag, not the object text, but the tag. In this case, the keynote speaker affiliation tag, and we all know what's going to be produced now as a result of you already see it in the hit box at the bottom there. Of course, again, we get what we've already seen, namely Wendell P. Mulberry Technologies Incorporated. Um, and what we have just done is <coughs> we have crossed the divide between an object data query and a metadata query. So what we have done is that we've actually turned this whole model around a bit and have run an operation at the same time on object data and on metadata. And this, I believe, is where recursion already starts. So not necessarily on a higher level of a completed markup, which is then discussed and analyzed and so forth, but it actually happens during textual analysis all the time, very base level. And that is why we need a dynamic model to take account of this. And here I propose to put the end metadata set to one object instance by the power of and so So well, this is very, uh, don't, don't take this too seriously. Um, it's a metaphor for the type of model that we need. This, in essence, is what I get out of a very practical project, and I start to reconsider that project in terms of its conceptual um, architecture. Thanks, Mark. was um, simply the, the old standoff model where you take the tags out of the text, you represent them externally in a single set with the direct offsets into the text, uh, and that means you generally, they don't uh, attempt to edit, you could edit the, the text, but you'd have to adjust the offsets. Um, so you can have only one set of markup at one time, and the markup has a syntax, 
Uh, that is to say, if there is nesting, it obeys the rules of the, the syntax. Now, is that true or false? Just, just clarify that. But you can already um, import somebody else's markup and amalgamate it with your own markup, plus their tag sets at the same time. So it's sort of a workaround solution for what the next version is actually doing via the repository function. How does that work? Because if I have a syntax of um, a play structure, someone else has a syntax of a metrical structure, and uh, they put it uh, on top of that, then first of all, I haven't got a grammar for the total document. I don't have a, a structural and a metrical grammar, and I don't have uh, a grammar that can handle tags that overlap because you haven't guaranteed that the elements are well formed within the merged document. I might have uh, a metrical structure which overlaps the end of a line, for example. So how do you, how do you handle that when you merge two tag sets? Isn't that a copyright? 
as of your images, you can now, for example, use part of the image for the study. So your use may be within German copyright. Yes. So it's research. And now the, the uh, test samples that we use are, are, uh, is comprised of texts that are outside the copyright <coughs> um, law. Um, so we make sure that we, we're really uh, not in the gray zone there. But of course, you don't know what your user is going to do. Uh, you know that Google will be the most valuable um, of course, you know, for some time I've tracked and really admire it, you know, not just the technical level, but also the, the rationales that you offer and the theoretical framing of it, which leads me to say that, no, this is not on the wrong track, because I, because I think that the theoretical you know, implications are, are really very clear in terms of where we take market technologies, the kinds of things that we intend to do with market technologies. We actually have intended to do for a very long time, but have not really had the ability to do so because of the way in which the technologies have evolved. So, um, you know, and of course, uh, you know, um, Alex pointed out that there's a very, very close, you know, in fact, once you start with the recursive annotation model, yes, you're talking about the right? Okay. So, I'm looking to look for opportunities there because I think that that synergy may be very productive going forward. And so my question to you is in, in terms of what one offers, just in a very, 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 very simple model of arbitrary annotation of ranges, the labeling ranges, but you can also have anonymous ranges and annotations. You can attach arbitrary properties to ranges and to annotations. You can annotate annotations, so you get your recursion. Is there anything there that you have know that you need that liminal doesn't really give you? No, I think most of it is actually there. Uh, we haven't investigated that uh, systematically, though, I must say. Uh, we've just approached this from a very pragmatic point of view, and I must also confess that a lot of the developments and the extensions that, that we have built into the system are actually the result from terms of feedback. So, to, to give you one example, the one that we're working on now is our users want the ability to comment on their annotation. And they want to do that freestyle. So they want to be able to write into their tag. I developed this tag after I ran into Julia would let me do that now. For whatever reason. <laughs> Julia wouldn't let me do that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, I, I, part of the, the question is to test whether I understand uh, what, what you're doing or not. Um, the, uh, so, so, so first off, it, it, this seems to, if I understand it correctly, there's a, a really nice instantiation of the uh, aphorism that one man's uh, data is another man's metadata here. Um, there's nothing new and original about being able to search uh, metadata separately from data. I mean, you know, any, any mail email interface lets you search on both metadata fields and the text of your email at the same time. But if I understand correctly, you're using the same data model to mark them both in, in, in the abstract, big data model to mark them both up simultaneously, and then permitting the user to cross over whether you're treating them the same, are they permitted to treat them differently too? Can I search for for things only in the metadata or only oh, yes. in the data? Oh, yes. and, 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 and then and you do extracts and various studies on, on just this part. Sure. You, you might you might want to run a query just on on the metadata. Um, no problem. Um, but, but conceptually, I think the, the, the interesting thing to me was to realize that the crossing of this divide happens at a very fundamental level, whereas I always thought, you know, this switch from, from basic operation to the meta operation and this going recursive actually only happens much later, you know, when the finite product is there and then <coughs> I analyze it and I criticize it and hey, then I go into the meta level, but we're doing that constantly uh, with such a simple query that we're actually doing that already. So that's why I think we need a, a data model that takes account of that. Well, what you talked about, and you heard about this time perspective, and could you use 
this here in your model too, and then say um, the same text, and obviously people try to annotate the same thing, but they obviously they have differences of opinion. Yeah. And how do you appropriately you know, visualize the results? Yeah, okay, very good point, and you should have mentioned that. Um, we're thinking of actually extending the tag syntax and by putting in timestamp or by using the identifier to point to some file that preserves um, the timestamps. So I could call, let's say I could amalgamate your markup and my markup and your markup might have been produced during three different sessions, three consecutive days. So every tag that you produced on day one will have a specific timestamp. Day three, plus it will identify you as the IP owner, so to speak. That's one aspect we're taking on, uh, taking care of in the repository, by the way, um, because it's an intellectual property issue when you start exchanging markup who owns this markup. And my markup will have the same um, identifiers in terms of ownership and timestamps and so forth. And then if you want to run a study on this um, for some of course it's there. You have it in the market. But then I would have to infer kind of schema from this and then compare the schemes of the Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a side question. You're using feature structure markup in a way that uh, uh, much more extensively than uh, than almost any other than any other project I know. Uh, I wonder if you have found any use for or need for the feature system declaration. That the yes, um, it actually is. Uh, ah, there. You go. Thank you. Need to work with that? Okay. Thank you.
transcription depends on the expected usages of transcribed documents. With the digital turn at the latest, users have expectations towards transcriptions that are way beyond the linguistic code. I will skip some cases. Um, largely based on a series of tags that I have elaborated earlier, maybe 10 years ago, and presented elsewhere, but haven't published in an accessible way so far, I'm really sorry for that. That series of tags aims on tags not as a creation of new texts, but on tags as the reproduction of textual objects. Insofar, it's a useful basis for modeling transcription as well. To keep it very, very short, what is text as a reproduction of text? Text an attempt to convey meaning by expressing it verbally and fixing it with a document or by a medium. There are other positions in between these main three positions. Text may be seen as, for example, a work with a specific structure beyond the linguistic code. Text may be seen as a set of graphs, signs, or themes that can be interpreted as meaning characters or words. And text can be seen as a visual phenomenon that sometimes carries semantic information directly and not via written language. That's why this forms a circle and not a line. Of course, I do not intend to state that there are only six notions of text, but rather that there is a whole universe of textual notions, sometimes even mixed or to be located as ranges on the wheel of text, uh, which I would call a pluralistic model of text. So let's talk about transcription. Transcription is reading written down again. That's why traditionally transcription leads to a linear set of characters and words. Text is what you look at and how you look at it. Text and transcription is defined by the glasses you wear, by the tools you apply. Transcription is mapping perception towards the target system. And then by reading or applying textual criticism you add information to the transcription. So there are reproductive and productive forces at work. What we create with digital transcriptions are potentially information-rich resources, representations that are not media presentations in the first place, but that are transmedia digital representations, which become media presentation in further step of processing. Transcription as a result of reading that seems to be pretty straightforward. You read text and write it down. But that's not true when you take a closer look at it. What you get is a physical document. What you see is a visual thing. What you read are signs, use, graphemes. And the result is a construction. Let's have another example. What you see might be a picture. On a graphene level, we would have to transcribe it like that. Recoding it in the contemporary alphabet that it doesn't have a V would lead to this one. Taking our modern alphabet as a target system would lead to this one. But universal as a word is not the result of a simple rule-based character translation or identification. It's a result of the identification of the string as representing a certain abstract word, which then is written down again. That was a traditional approach uncovered. That was the approach as triggered by print culture and its promotion of an abstract and word letter oriented notion of text. With the digital turn and its support for visual presentation as well as multiple presentation, a pluralistic notion of text is facilitated. In this media and culture environment, various information channels may be transcribed and encoded, like an image, mise en page, description of textual areas, graphemes, graphs, letters, or the structure of a work. Still, transcription is the distinction between noise and information, between noise and signal. And that distinction is made 
by the chosen text model or target system, which is like a pair of glasses. What is noise for one target system is information or signal for another. There will never be a possibility for not having noise filtered out. No possibility to be complete towards all possible recordable facts. There is another old problem that can be addressed by this approach. Authenticity and identity. Identity is determined by the limits of the target system. A document and its transcription can be identical if the transcription is complete and without errors according to the target system and its rules. Identity may lie in the use of documents and transcriptions. If they serve the same purposes equally well, they might be called identical. Some of the transcriptional processes seem to be productive rather than reproductive. But some people might argue as well that this is not transcription but rather editing. Possible examples of productive processes in, in, in transcription are shown here. We could say we have reproductive forces mainly on the side of the physically and visually given and productive forces on the side of the more abstract notions of text. Maybe this isn't very convincing since all transcriptive processes are interpretative processes and interpre interpretation is productive. And it may depend on your own notion of text. If you believe that a text is completely constituted by the linguistic code, then you may understand the notation of that linguistic code as reproductive, as a reproductive act rather than a productive act, as I would do. Maybe we would have to concede that within the mapping from the document towards the target system, there are interpretative and thus productive processes. Think of a physical description of a document, a manuscript description, for example. So we would have to draw another line between reproduction and production, as is shown here. Maybe the distinction between reproductive and productive forces isn't that productive at all. I liked it for a while, but I feel increasingly uncomfortable with it. It would be the first occasion where I would disagree with Matt Stahlström. Elena has called it, uh, in another wording, the shift from the mimetic to the analytic level. Maybe that's a better wording. Maybe I will switch to that in the future. Anyway, nowadays, transcription is not only the act of writing down again what has been the result of reading anymore. But with the technologies at hand, it's rather the protocol of reading processes. There's a multitude of possible mappings at the same time. I'd like to make a strong argument here for recording these multiple mappings, which can be justified by the multiple audiences and usage scenarios we have. I'd like to make another strong argument for diplomatic detailed transcriptions as close as possible to the document. Reading steps are based on each other. Readings are incremental, even over time, with various uh, transcribers or users. There is no way back if you start on a higher level. So you ha we have to start on a level as basic as possible. And I'd like to stress the usefulness of the record of multiple mappings, not just the final results of interpretation. We have seen examples for that in the previous slides, like uh, having a facsimile, which is a sort of transcription to me, and the text, which is obviously. Another trivial example would be to record the abbreviation and the expansion. That's what we do nowadays. But it's a record, it's a notation of multiple readings, of course. Another example. Let's assume we have a text represented or described as a digital image. We have a portion of text describable as a segment, as a zone, for example, uh, of the page having coordinates. You may note that there are signs or even characters which are, as they are, like sick, uh, as they are translated to a certain target alphabet, that is already an, uh, a strong step in, in processing and interpreting, identifying letters and uppercase, lowercase mode, or which might be corrected 
because found to be erroneous as compared to an abstract notion of a certain word and its autographic canonized presentation. You may as well visually note that the print mode is italics. You may interpret that as being highlighted compared to the surrounding text. Or you may find that this has to be called an emphasized mode. And then you may interpret either the word as being or the mode as indicating a person name, which you may identify as the name of a certain identifiable person. And you may as well express this by an RDF statement like, this text is talking about this person. So what we have is multiple notations as a protocol of a reading process where steps are built on each other. The act of transcribing aims at information-rich transcriptions as transmedia representations, which is another theory of mine, which uh, I will not go in detail anymore. Uh, from these certain presentations, which are new documents, but which we may as well call performances or editions of a document, of a work, ETC, can be generated or medialized. And these may emphasize or address particularly certain notions of text, like a critical work-oriented edition versus a diplomatic document-oriented uh, edition. Can we see? certain set of uh, graphemes, let's say, for the moment. Of course, this is all known to you. Sometimes it's simply called the single source principle. But I wanted to show this again to make a point for thinking not just in terms of intended presentations or purposes of an intended edition, but also in terms of a description of text as abstract and information rich and neutral towards presentation media as possible. And yes, I know that there are limits for that approach. One of the oldest core questions on transcription is surely objectivity and subjectivity. The traditional approach distinguishes between Befund und Deutung, as we have heard yesterday, between record or objectively identifiable features, an A is an A is an A, and interpretation on the other hand. Surely I'm not the only one here who doesn't really believe in this distinction anymore. I'd suppose, as a starting point for further discussion, to distinguish two levels. First, every act, oops, hmm. What do you see? Oh, everything. Yeah. No surprise anymore. Every act of transcription is interpretative in the same way, as it is a process of mapping towards a target system. These target systems are disputable. Maybe they are arbitrary. No target system can be complete since it's related to future research questions, questions which we cannot know yet. For example, I will map these letters onto a given alphabet. I will describe these textual features according to a certain model of a textual genre. There is, for example, a salutation in a letter. Or another example, I will take a digital image of this document with 300 dpi this color range, this camera, this lens, and this light. All of these are target systems which are disputable and which have to be chosen about. Uh, second, decisions within these mappings towards target systems might be disputable in different ways and on different levels. Two transcribers taking pictures with the same camera in the same setup will probably get the same result. Two transcribers working with the same target alphabet and transcribing strictly on the character level will agree on 99% of the characters. That might be less or more when they transcribe on the word level. Why don't I see all my notes? Um, but, but as we all know, if we give transcribers a non-trivial document and let them transcribe it according to the guidelines of the TI, we will probably never get the same result twice. Okay, 
but the last one was a trap because here I mixed both levels. If you give somebody just the TI guidelines, you haven't clearly defined the target system, so you cannot take that as an example. Okay, um, what is it good for? Uh, I think such a model is good for many things. First of all, it's interesting or it's good for uh, analysis in media history. Which media or text technology supports which notion of text? It might further be useful in teaching textuality, transcription, or editing. It's an extremely simplifying model. That's why it's useful to teach people about uh, textuality. It's a means for cartography and visualization to support better understanding. For example, what do people mean when they talk about transcription or text? So if we have, for example, the literature, articles like uh, that one by um, Klaus Hütfeld and uh, Michael Spurbeck McQueen, uh, what is transcription? We can locate that article on that wheel of text. We can say they are talking about this range, this portion of the model. Um, the same is true for recent works uh, of Peter Stokes on paleography and transcription, on graphs, ideographs, allographs, characters, ontographs. We could as well locate the work of Peter Stokes at a certain place in that model. The same is true for when Melissa Terrace uh, talks on markup on a stroke level. Then she's moving somewhere on text G, text as graphs or graph themes. Or when Melissa Terrace talks about the critical implication of digital imaging. This is talking about transcription in a certain sense. Or when Wendell Peets yesterday talked about text as reaching from plain text to tables. Well, tables are always a very interesting case when we discuss textuality because with the tables we can see that sometimes the text and its meaning, its semantics, leaps over the, uh, the linguistic code because the table is, uh, in the first place, given visually as a visual structure and we derive a meaning and semantics from it from that visual structure and not from the words that are inserted in the cells. Anyway, um, how does the model relate to other models? That would be another question. As we said yesterday, maybe we should look for a model of the models we use. Which ranges of the model are covered by which standard in which way? This can also be cartographied, I don't know. The model may help in the assessment and further development of these standards. And it may serve as a reference for software development. I still dream of a software that supports the notation of a protocol of reading, or as we read. Okay, two examples. How does the model relate to other models? One very trivial example is, of course, this one. Ferber. Ferber can be located here, like that, very, very roughly. You would have to have a more detailed discussion, of course, but that is roughly where Ferber could be localized. Or another example. Which ranges of the model are covered by standards in which way? Let's have a look at the TI. Obviously, the TI is traditionally focused on certain notions of text more than on others. So the TI assumes that uh, basically that you have uh, a linguistic code, and you talk about the linguistic code, for example, in terms of uh, structures of genre. That's where the TI is best at, I think. So the TI, in this point of view is not complete and it has some biases. But maybe things are on a good way in this example. Because there we have the SIG uh, on, on manuscripts, we have the SIG on ontologies, and we have another SIG on uh, graphics. So we could uh, think that the TI is on a good way, but of course, this is an extremely optimistic and friendly uh, picture of the TI, as it pretends that there are no gaps left maybe sometimes someone will locate all single elements and attributes on this map. That would be nice and it would be 
maybe show another picture where TEI has biases and where it's, it's strong and, and where it's weak. And we have another example for another SIG. Uh, where can that be located, uh, the SIG for linguistics? You can see it's not so, so easy to uh, stick to that uh, very um, closed model. Uh, everything has its place and uh, fills a gap and so on. <clears throat> and as I said, it may serve, that model may serve as a reference for the development of software that would ideally, ideally support multiple uh, notions and multiple um, notations of texts. Okay, are there further challenges? Um, yes. Um, what I would like to do, or what I would like to see being done uh, in the future is uh, testing the usefulness of the model with real cases, for example, of, of editing, so we can uh, use that as uh, yeah, as a guideline for, for, for reviewing uh, editions, so to, uh, to assess uh, what notion of text is behind this transcription or this edition, what, what uh, range of notions of text are covered by this uh, edition. Of course, this model needs uh, further um, detailed modeling. For example, the situation in, in text as a grapheme is, is a wide range, covers a wide range of phenomena, of features that uh, people want to, to transcribe. So if I would talk to Peter Stokes, uh, I expect that he would uh, tell me, well, you have to be more differentiated and, and deal that, and you, you have this and that, and you cannot uh, pack it all together. So we have to be uh, more detailed in, in certain uh, areas uh, of uh, that model. We have to talk about various levels of abstraction. Uh, maybe uh, what, what I um, showed was, uh, processes of reading and interpretation going uh, counterclockwise uh, around the model. Oh, the model here, the model. Okay, going uh, counterclockwise around the model, but we can also argue that sometimes abstraction and interpretation uh, takes another direction, going from the core of it to outer orbits, I would say, uh, <clears throat> instead of moving uh, around that wheel. Okay, we might further think about transcription and text as an ontological compound object because what is in inherent in, in that model is, um, is a problem. Um, what is actually the ontological status of the things we are describing? And that model suggests that we are describing different things at the same time. Um, we can further think about um, the depiction of the further levels or further entities uh, on that model. And we would find out then that it's hard to draw a clear borderline for the single further elements. So uh, even if you try to transcribe a further item, you will insert information that belongs to the manifestation, expression, or work level. That's what I mean with, with ontological compound object. Um, um, we can think about which steps in mapping and interpretation should be represented explicitly since many of these processes are rule-based, of course. So the question is, should we note the rules or the results of the application? For example, uh, we could note a rule. All cases of the letter U before other vowels may be converted to the letter V for certain usage scenarios, but then we wouldn't have to uh, note uh, explicitly a V in addition to a U, like in universe. Um, what about concurrent interpretations in their notations? Then interpretation may depend on context. We would have to discuss where a borderline between textual representation and external talking about a text may be found. We would have to model interconnections between different documents in text as well as same texts. So what if you uh, take the work as a starting point for transcription, then you have to integrate various documents. But on the other hand, if you start with a physical document, you have to share information on the work level with other documents. How can we depict these relationships? And finally, of course, we have the problem of texts and their context and the contextuality. How can we depict uh, that on such a model? But that's it for the moment, and thank you very much. Thank you. 
manuscript. This is very evident that the result of this transcription is the result of your interpretation of the text and what you mean, what you see there, or what you interpret that the representation may be like. And this is different with the sort of mechanical approach of transliteration. And so I think there's a step before transcription that could take into account as well. But, so but, but then you mean with transliteration, identification of characters, right? Well, or let's say uh, signs. Uh, okay. Um, so first, thank you very much for a very interesting um, model to, to, to think about. Um, I first want to um, just confess that I was initially lulled into a, se a false sense of security um, when I had presumed that your use of the word transcription uh, just as I was lulled in the correct sense when Alan uh, used the word well, intentionality, that your use of the term transcription was similar to Sperber McKean and Hickel's use of the term transcription, but in fact, it's, they're almost completely unrelated, actually. <laughs> um, but, but, but in that false and security area, one thing that's fun to do with a, a, a talk is kind of to poke at its premises uh, right away. Um, and I think your second slide or so, you said that there are um, it's not the case that um, uh, there are writing systems for which we can, right? Like, can I phrase that properly? It's <laughs> yeah, it takes some time, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Very impressive, by the way. Uh, yeah, but we are nearly there. <laughs> yeah, here we are. One, one uh, point. Yeah, let's, point down. Let's, let's make the most No, one, one, one slide back, perhaps. Uh, it's not possible to draw a border between the essential marker features. All features are relative to, uh, I think, next slide back or next slide forward. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm, my, my mind is just bottled by watching this go by. And no, it can't. Back, 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 um, there is nothing uh, here. <laughs> so uh, it must have been. Uh, I must be making it up. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> if it's not. Possible. So, so it's not possible to draw clear borders between essential and arbitrary features and attributes of text. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that, that that's probably true for some character sets. And I'll bet in, in the room we would all, uh, or most of us at least, agree that on some character set, for some character sets that's true. But I'm wondering if we wouldn't also be able to come up with character sets for which it's not true. That's right. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking about, about non true <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there might be a document that is uh, simple and simply contains printed characters and we would all agree <coughs> on these characters. But my problem is, um, what are we interested in when we deal with text? We are interested sometimes in, in, in the meaning it could be. And that may lie not in the characters. And that's where we use uh, every border. This is where I fall foul of that. So if, if we say, okay, the scripture is about the characters, then we maybe can find a safe ground. But if I'm working with, with historians, for example, which are interested in facts or something like that, which are not <laughs> conveyed by, by the linguistic code by something else, what can I do for them? How can I argue to them, well, you could have a transcription, but it would have no sense, no value for you. Let's go back to the transliteration point. And in fact, I, I don't think there is such a thing as a mechanical thing ever. For instance, when you refer the universe and universum, the passage between the U and the V, is that a transliteration? It's just a change of the alphabet. We change the alphabet since the moment in which universe written with a V or with a U was more or less the same thing. Um, so we could call it that a transliteration, uh, the long S into the small S, is that just a change of character? We change the alphabet, so we do that. But the fact that we are able to get to the universal that is involved over there is because we map it to our mind to, of the word universal that we know. So it makes sense for us to do that. So, I mean, it, I do agree with the fact that there is a very fuzzy line in between what 
know what it is on the page, but we did what we choose to see on the page. Because that is the point that is very important. My opinion is not that you're ever reproducing what is on the page, but only what you choose to see on the page. Because put two people together, if there's a printed character, etc., we start to say, okay, yeah, but the new line is that the same thing, we can decide not to do the, the, the dimension, the spacing between the letters. Are we always thinking about that? Sometimes the justification of the margin makes bigger space. Is that relevant? Perhaps it isn't. But the point is that, again, it's always made choices. And there is, in my opinion, as you said, something. But the evidence that Elena speaks the truth is that if you weren't correct, there wouldn't be CAPTCHA. What do you mean by CAPTCHA? CAPTCHA, the, uh, the character ah, description system, right? Uh, at, at three level level, perhaps they are happy with that simplification. Perhaps when you do a manuscript, perhaps you're not happy with the simplification. Or oh, sometimes you are. The point is that you cannot say uh, a priori that this is the way it works. You never can say that. And every operation you do from the, when you look at the manuscript, you type something or you write with the pencil, is an editorial interpretation. That's what it is. Um, yeah, I, I would have to completely disagree with you, Thomas. I don't think you did define transcription. It, my problem is that you, transcription seems to, to smear itself across everything from, from duplication to interpretation. Uh, and, and if you're going to model transcription, <coughs> what I didn't get from your model, I thought your model was fascinating and had valuable, a lot of insight in it, but what I didn't get was a model of what you meant by transcription. What, what, what is the process that's going on? I mean, as, as flawed as, as I think Michael would agree his initial model was, at least that was trying to say, this is the process, this is what happened. It was an attempt to define transcription uh, in the process of modeling. And what, what I didn't get from your model was that you were actually defining transcription. You were modeling and, and defining a bunch of issues around transcription, but not in the center. I couldn't see what was there. Yeah, but, but what you ask is uh, what I've noted here. Where, where is the border? Where's the border between uh, transcribing the text? Reproducting the text and talking about the te text productively. And my problem is I haven't found that border. But, but if but the concept of transcription is to have any meaning, then you've got to put a border around. Yeah, right, right. I should have a border, <laughs> but I don't have one. If you could give me a border, I would destroy <laughs> the border. <laughs> 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 this may, this may uh, uh, address. We'll back to the second slide. <laughs> <laughs> the one that talks about the failure of the, of the traditional model. Um, I think that we're talking about the failure of the traditional approach to transcription as a method of representing text, and not the failure of a particular account of transcription as an account of transcription. So to come back to your historians, yes, you say to a historian, the historian says, but I don't care what characters are in the in, in manuscript, I only care about the facts that are attested. My response to the historian is, or my question for you is, since when, in the concept of transcription, take on the responsibility for making every historian happy? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're not happy with the transcription. So? Yes, transcription is not an adequate way to represent every phenomenon that's relevant to textuality. No, there is a difference in the lexicon of English as normally spoken between transcription and facsimile reproduction. And it is precisely the elimination of certain classes of information that make the distinction between transcriptions and facsimiles. There's no need to define transcription in such a way as to ensure that the result is an adequate tool for every conceivable logical operation, scientific operation. Indeed, if you want to know what transcription is good for, you must 
be willing to assign limits and say, yes, this explains why transcriptions don't do certain things, and they do do others. I see the argument, I see the point, but still, mm -hmm. I, would, I would ask, how can you define, when you say transcription is about translating signs from a document, how can you define the window of that? Still, I haven't seen for example, if, if you have a line break, mm -hmm. it's not a sign. Isn't it? Well, it's, okay, it's not a discussion, but, but you know. <laughs> it's, it's a serious question. It's yeah. a serious question. In any paleographic transcription prepared by a graduate of the Ecole des Chartes, line breaks will be marked. Yeah, exactly. Why? Because for them, it is an important graphemic element. <coughs> and the writing system that they are reading in the document but makes them want to distinguish no. that. Now, they transcribe it into another writing system in which it's typically represented in a different way, with a vertical but bar. You tell me, when you talk about transcription, look it up in the dictionary. Mm -hmm. And then you say, the line break is a sign. So I would say, well, look no. it up in the dictionary. I, no, you you I, said the graphemic I, 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 I asked a question. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, I, claim that, uh, I claim that the difference between transcriptions which record line breaks and transcriptions which do not is quite often traceable to the difference in the writing system applied by the two transcribers. When people disagree so fundamentally, it may be good to have dinner together. <laughs> Your model is this nice little circle, right? Mm -hmm. Which makes me think of David. But, uh, but at 10.30, there is this thing which I as an art historian, there is like ontologies on top, if I have understood it right, and there is a visual out there at say 10 o'clock. How do you connect this? You talked about the, the rest of the clock all the time. No, no, no I don't know what you mean is 10.30. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, so what is the problem with 10.30? Just a moment, please. Uh, 10.30. Okay, so, um, no, you can, ask yeah, for Some kind of sort of ontological status. 
So, and I mean, we can hear it in, like the comments switch back and forth as we go from one person to another. So one person says, says, uh, says, you know, uh, you know, uh, what is essential and what is arbitrary in the text depends on, on, on what you're trying to do, and two people will agree, and, and that, you know, and, and that's fine. And the next person says, if you don't draw a box around the word transcription and say what it means, it doesn't mean anything. And so for me, you know, what the, the, the way the conversation is shaking out, and it seems to be critical in a, in a discussion of data modeling, is, is, is that is thinking about that difference. Because that, that deciding where you are on the spectrum between the world is births and the world is nouns, it seems to me, you know, sort of, dip, dip, you know, has, a, has an effect on the way you think about computational systems and their, and their, and their use or their being. I mean, carrying on this discussion about the terminology there, we're somehow the prisoners of a terminology from the past, which we're trying to apply again and again, even to someone who's trying to look to the future. I mean, who cares about transliteration, transcription, annotation? We wanted to kill the primary source yesterday. We are, we've got, <laughs> or, or annotations as well. I mean, we've got categories in a context where we've seen that with the previous talk. We've got a continuum of objects which we enrich. And most of these objects, we don't have a category. We don't have a noun or a verb for that, for the operation. We know we've had a, an evolutionary stage. So when we annotate, or when we speak, like you said, I mean, this was very, essential when you said, I mean, speaking about a text is like transcribing or annotating or what have you. It's just a series of stages. So we need an underlying theory for considering how we organize this graph of changes from a physical object when it exists, because sometimes part of the job is just to reconstruct an object that we know may have existed. I mean, this is the case in many uh, works and manuscripts. And at the end of the day, we've got an object which is never the end of the day because it's obviously the primary source for further studies. And this is our dream in a way, is to bring a pool of objects which are constantly enriched by further scholarly activities. So we should try to forget, to try to put those things, where is annotation there, where is transcription, transliteration. Basically, we need to be able to get rid of that. Not easy, because we don't have the words to speak about this. Aren't you totally overrating digital, the digital? I mean, it's it's a new medium, but uh, it's not the radical change of the world. We are still working with primary sources and sorry, world world. And, uh, and so, so I'm not sure that the big revolution won't be coming back to the same concepts because they were used in very many different concepts. Well, I mean, you need to. I mean, the big revolution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.